This is World to Win, bringing you the latest news and analysis from a socialist perspective. Welcome back, everyone, to World to Win. I'm Toya. I'm here with Yara, and we have two guests that are talking about a new development that's happening, a really exciting development in the labor movement. But before we get started, I, of course, want to say hi to Yara. Yara, what's going on? How have you been? Oh, it's been busy. It's been so busy, but all good. Um, Very exciting. Uh, We have a national committee meeting uh, this weekend. So there's a lot of uh, uh, things to read uh, about kind of Britain and our perspectives for the future, uh, which actually we did have an episode of World to Win about uh, a couple of weeks ago. So you should check it out if you're interested. How about you, Toya? What, What have you been up to? Um, nothing new. I uh, am studying for my electrical license exam, so a little stressed about that, but hopefully I can pass it on the first try. Um, I mean, obviously you can. Yeah, I'll be a real electrician. I won't be an apprentice anymore. It'll be great. Comes with a pay raise, a little bit more respect on the job, you know, pretty excited about it. We'll have to celebrate here. Oh, there will be celebrations. Don't you worry. Um, So let's get started. We have two guests with us today, one from Northern Ireland. We have Amy, who is a coffee shop worker. Amy, how how have you been? What what have you been up to? Yeah, how's it going? Um, Well, this is actually my last day of isolation with COVID, so I haven't been up to much. Um, Mostly just chatting, union organizing, getting ready, getting inspired by the Starbucks workers, I have to say, and just getting a pile of reading done. So... That's about it for me. Well, we're glad to have you here. And I forgot to mention that you yourself are a unionized coffee shop worker with Unite the Union Northern um, Irish Hospitality, and you're the branch secretary. So that's that's pretty exciting. Um, We also have Sam White um, from the U.S., who is also a union coffee shop worker with Unite Here. Sam, what have you been up to? Yeah, um, a lot of the same. Um, it's, it's a really exciting time to, to brush up on a lot of labor history and, and apply it to the really exciting situations going on right now. Um, I was just out in Seattle. I think we're going to talk a bit more about that. We just had this, um, this really exciting um, get together of unionizing coffee shop workers, a lot of Starbucks workers, uh, myself, members of Socialist Alternative, and of course, Shama Sawant um, in the city council there. Um, and yeah, in Boston, there's just a lot going on with this um, this coffee shop organizing wave. Yeah, so for those who haven't heard, right now in the U.S., we're seeing a wave of unionization efforts through coffee shop workers, which is a new thing in the U.S. It's not something, uh, it's not an industry that is uh, super organized, and it started in in New York State, in upstate New York, uh, in Buffalo, with Starbucks, but also some local coffee shop chains um, in the in the Boston area, like like Sam is um, an employee at, are all also unionizing. So it's really exciting, kind of coming off the bat of this wave of labor struggles that we're seeing in the U.S. We've called Striketober um, that happened at the end of 2021. You know, there were tons of workers on strike, Kellogg's workers um, that produce, you know, uh, our food. Um, The John Deere workers were on strike. We had nurses on strike, teachers on strike. Um, You know, we're just seeing this huge, huge upswing in the labor movement. But Sam, can you tell our, um, our viewers and our listeners a little bit more about what's happening specifically um, with Starbucks workers and also local coffee shop workers. Yeah, um, there's so much. It's like I, I feel like every time I try to talk about it, I'm uh, a step behind where we actually are. But at the time we're, um, we're having this conversation, there's somewhere around 60 uh, Starbucks locations across the United States um, that have filed for National Labor Relations Board elections, filed for union elections. Um, so far, two stores in Buff- both in Buffalo, New York, which was the, the starting point of this wave of Starbucks organizing. Two of those stores have won their union elections, um, and at the same time, you have a number of uh, local, like small businesses in, in different cities around the country that are doing the same thing. Um, so, in Boston, for instance, I work at um, a coffee shop called Darwin's Limited. Uh, we have uh, four; just it's just a four-store little local chain. Um, We're the second out of three so far that have gotten voluntary union recognition um, with this wave of young, um, you know, young coffee shop workers um, and very young workforce, average age of 24, um, 
disproportionately women, disproportionately queer, um, like leading this this wave of, of bringing unions to a, a historically unorganized sector in the country. So um, lots and lots of momentum there. Um, my my union is um, is moving into contract negotiations. We've just had a couple of sessions so far, but there's a lot of a lot of work to do in terms of um, strengthening um, our union and involving um, more of more of my coworkers in that. That is so amazing. And, and I think that everything that Toya said as well, like obviously uh, the US is notorious for the lack of organization, especially in the sectors. But I also think that generally across the world uh, in most places, these sectors are kind of traditionally unorganized. Uh, you know, it's a lot of uh, precarious work, a lot of zero hour contracts, a lot of people coming and going. And it's not one of the, you know, uh, bases of organized work. And I think that talking about Striketober uh, and all of that, I, I, it, it looks like there's kind of like specifically a US trend, but also an international tre- a trend of struggle. So whether it's getting involved in a union or organizing or going on strike, all of, like just industrial action generally just seems to be so much more prevalent now. And especially in these sectors that we haven't seen much organization before. So I was wondering, Sam, can you, can you tell us a little bit about why you think this is happening right now after all of these years of setbacks? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's exciting because it's, I, I feel like food service right now and coffee shops are just the latest of, of a bunch of industries. I mean, all industries, you know, eventually like started out with um a lot of these these same like precarious conditions and then fought for union recognition and they became sort of more respectable jobs food service has been very precarious like you said for a long time um zero error contracts or as we call it here um at will work like you can um you can lose your job at any time um you see people like if if there are benefits offered um at these coffee shop jobs um, it's often only if you work over like 35 hours a week and a lot of people don't both because of, um, uh, schedules not being, uh, dependable. You don't know when your, your hours are going to be often managers will like intentionally schedule you below that threshold so that you're excluded from the benefit pool. Um, yeah. And, and low pay, a dependence on tips, um, you know, harassment from, from customers, from management, no recourse for that. You know, you're dependent on, um, tips, especially in the U S like the, the, the question of tips is such a huge one. Um, you know, there's, there's an incentive when you, when most of your income is coming from tips to run the store with, with less staff. So everybody's more overworked and that makes it harder to like be able to keep your stamina up and work like a, a reasonable number of hours in a week to, uh, to even like be eligible for benefits. And of course you're dependent on those tips from customers who might be giving you a hard time, might be harassing you, might be creepy or, or whatever else. Um, so all of that was there and then COVID comes in and a lot of these coffee shops, um, you know, here and in other parts of the world stayed open. Um, you know, the, the ones that, um, do take out um, food. I mean, that that became like essential work, right? Like making um, food, making drinks for frontline workers, for for hospital staff, you name it. Um, but you know, through it all, like we generally haven't gotten hazard pay. We've had to work on the front lines of um, of of COVID, of, of customers coming in. There've been you know mask disputes, vaccine pol- vaccine enforcement. Um, you know where where there are vaccine requirements. Um, we have to enforce those, and it's it's hard to uh, to do that when if you offend somebody, they might not tip you, and therefore you might not like be able to take home pay. So all of that has just been there, has been bubbling over, um, and then in you know in the whole context of this economic period that we're in, um, we're seeing people just have the confidence to fight back. We've seen a lot of you know we've seen the great resignation, we've seen people leaving the workforce, but with those who've stayed, there's this uh, this increased. Uh, confidence and you know that is now taking root in an industry where where conditions have been pretty rough for a while um the precarity the the hazards on the job um and yeah so it's it's a new wave of of young people um recognizing their power to fight back through unions sam you touched on a couple topics that i definitely want to get back back to that question of hazard pay i mean this great resignation actually emboldening people to to you know, uh, be able to leave their jobs if they're unhappy. But before we get into into um, into those uh, ideas, I want to ask Amy. You know, you're on the other side of the Atlantic. 
Um, has this unionization effort in the U.S. had an effect at all um, in consciousness among your co-workers in Northern Ireland? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that actually over here in Northern Ireland, in the north, we're actually also in the midst of quite an uptick in industrial action, you know, in workplace struggle. Um, uh, so like already just over the past, you know, the past few months, we've seen a lot of disputes of, of key workers, especially, you know, people who have um, worked the whole pandemic with, you know, getting applauded, but then just getting actually nothing in return. We've seen lots of lots of their disputes over the issues of pay, casualization, actually walkouts against sectarianism as well, which I know were mentioned at an earlier podcast. Um, like we've had education workers go on strike, port workers go on strike, crash workers, um, electronics distributors, meat factory wildcat walkouts. Um, and actually there's a really important uh, um, a work in or occupation of a women's ho women's hostel at the minute uh, called Regina Chelly in Belfast um, over threats of closure. Um, I think you know those workers have received a, a lot of support from broader working class people at the minute because it's just I think it's just such an indictment of capitalism that when we're seeing a rise in gender ba based violence, we're seeing a sharpened housing crisis that such essential services are being slashed. You know, so that's that's the other context in terms of my own co-workers. I mean, it's really not an exaggeration that people are so buzzing right now about what's going on in Starbucks because, like as Sam mentioned about the Great Resignation. You know, and there has there had been this trend where people were starting to get a bit confident. You know, if if their employer was was like if their employer was trying to ask them to do ridiculous things, they'd just be like, "All right, I'm out of here." But actually, I think it's really interesting that the Starbucks workers and and the likes of Sam are actually pointing a way beyond that. You know, that you don't actually just have to go in this eternal search for a new job where you'll be treated badly inevitably, but actually you can come to go with to come together with your coworkers and do something about it. Um, and there's been a lot of like uh unofficial actions we're hearing of like people just extending their breaks or closing cafes early just because they're tired and stuff which is really interesting as well yeah i think the, the thing about the the great resignation like both of you talked about it and i think it's really interesting because there's obviously around the world we're seeing it in every sector there's huge labor shortages and uh, a lot of people just like up and leaving their jobs because they're not paying enough and they just like, they just can't stand it anymore. And I think the point that you're making, Amy, is is so interesting in that in that regard because it's beyond just because we know that it's not just the one boss that's uh, the problem. It's uh, and especially in hospitality, it's literally every boss is going to be bad. So leaving is may maybe very empowering on a personal level, but it doesn't actually fix the problem. So unionizing is kind of like this way forward so I was I was wondering both Sam and Amy like uh, what, what 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 are your thoughts about it like do you think that this kind of wave of unionization is the next step in the great resignation yeah I, I can come in I guess I, I think yeah it's it's like it's a step beyond I mean like quitting was always the norm in in food service in the U.S. like there's it's an industry with massively high turnover always was or at least you know in the last period like um you know well over 100 percent up to even like 400 percent employee turnover in a given year um and and yeah and this this points to um just a new recognition of the power that workers have um in society is i guess what i would say um yeah this this recognition that um you know, I, I think a lot among like a lot of my coworkers and a lot of these um, these coffee shop unions that are emerging, like one of the the main things that gets talked about is this desire for democracy at work. You know, people are feeling um, so left out of decision making in so much of their lives and especially at work. I mean, you you go and you clock in and you give up any like um, agency that you have. You have to, do, you know, you have to do whatever busy work that um, the management wants, wants you to do on a given day. Yeah, but Sam at Starbucks, they're called partners. So they must have some sort of say in the day to day workings because they're partners, you know, with the executives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's that's what um, Starbucks corporate would like them and everybody else to think is that they're on equal footing they're they're partners but um but no i mean you see them it's interesting that they're they're that starbucks workers in particular um are you know leaning into the description of partners and saying what would a real partnership look like what what would it mean if we actually stood on equal footing with the bosses and i think it's really positive um that 
you know, there's a recognition that the way that, that you do that, the way that you have power that is comparable to the power of a multi-billionaire like Howard Schultz, the, the you know, the um, owner of Starbucks, um, the way you do that is by organizing um, amongst your coworkers, organizing, um, organizing amongst the people who, who like are the ones who are making all that profit in the first place are the ones who have the potential to, like Amy was saying, like, like stop, like close the store earlier or withhold their labor and, and therefore hurt the, hurt the bosses where it hurts, which is in their profits. Yeah, exactly. And I think like Sam mentions a really important point in that like the this idea of a great resignation of of resigning when you just hate you you just fed up with your job isn't actually anything new in hospitality. And it's actually been like quite a historic, a big historic barrier to successfully organizing in hospitality, you know, because you'll be getting to a stage in a workplace where you're you're you know, you're ramping up your organizing campaign and then people are like, Oh, do you know what? I'm just gonna leave. So I think like in that context, um, it is really interesting right now to see just that like with with what we were talking about in terms of like staffing shortages like people recognizing this like huge amount of leverage they have over their employers where like we we know at this point our employers need us 10 times more than we need them because we could walk into any job and i think you've got those things coming together where you actually there's actually a real potential here to just like wipe out these old barriers that have plague the industry in terms of actually making real change like that, which I think is so exciting. It's super inspiring to see people organizing and having the confidence and, you know, asking for more money. But um, I want to get into specifically the demands that the Starbucks workers and other coffee shop workers are organizing around. I know uh, uh, COVID demands were one of the main things. And actually, there was a huge victory in Buffalo around the question of COVID um, that was won not just for those two stores in Buffalo that uh, went on strike, but for the entire company. It is so exciting. Sam, can you talk a little bit about what those workers did? Yeah, that's a, a super exciting development there and a really huge victory on, a part, on the part of some of those, those first workers um, that, um, you know, so, like I, like I was saying, like um, baristas have been um, really up against um, s some of the, the worst of the dangers of, of COVID. And so these workers in Buffalo at one of the stores that just won their union, union election, one of the first um, unionized uh, coffee shops in this wave of organization, um, they, uh, they walked out over the lack of transparency over COVID cases that so many of us in the industry have seen. Um, against you know the the store being run on a skeleton crew because the coworkers were out sick with with COVID and they um, they said you know what we're we're gonna go on strike until um until the the company like actually uh, pays us to uh, isolate like we should you know to to stay home from work you know as as everything stands like you're incentivized to go into work when you're sick or to to take risks that nobody should be taking um, for themselves or for everybody else, like putting customers, putting coworkers at risk. Um, so these workers uh, stood up to that. They said, uh, we're gonna go on strike. They they walked out, they had a, a five day long strike. And at the end of that, they, um, the, the, the company, Starbucks corporate conceded that they were, um, going to pay for, for isolation if you've been exposed to COVID on the job. So an absolutely massive victory and one that Starbucks has um, extended to not just that one store, but to um, all stores across the country, which is a massive development, a massive victory um, of those workers who took the, the courageous decision to go on strike over it. That's so important and, and so inspiring, I think, for every kind of worker, both in hospitality and other kind of um, uh, sectors that are exposed to COVID uh, massively. Um, but I was wondering, is it just, is, are the unionization efforts, like all other demands, just about COVID? Or are they talking about something beyond just, you know, the current situation and the health uh, situation? Um, I think there's a whole lot that is in play in terms of what these workers across the country are going to start fighting for. Um, but this question of demands is a really important one. Um, and you get varied answers. I think um, one thing that we are seeing right now is a real need to to deepen this question of demands um, for workers to, uh, especially this, this leading layer of workers who is um, helping to organize these union drives. 
Um, there's a need to really um, get into conversations with a broader layer of their coworkers. Um, and and find out what the what the main demands are. Obviously, pay is a huge one. We're we're a very underpaid workforce. Um, questions of benefits. It's interesting because Starbucks does offer a number of benefits um, that some smaller chains don't, but at the price of extremely exploitative work. Like you're there's there's no stopping. It's it's you know very very intense to to work at Starbucks. That you know every every minute of your time is. Um, uh, you're under a lot of pressure. Um, so there's a lot of demands around um, just democracy on the job. And then the COVID demands have been an expression of that. Workers should have um, decision-making power to, to, you know, to decide how their stories run because a lot of those, uh, there's a lot of shift leads, a lot of um, workers who really know what it takes to run a successful coffee shop who are completely disempowered from uh, decisions over um, ordering or over staffing or the, the types of things that make everything run smoothly on the job. Um, so a democratic impulse, um, there's these, these questions of um, pay and benefits and extending them to a broader layer of workers. Um, you know, inflation is skyrocketing at the moment and wages are definitely not keeping pace with that. Um, so, um, yeah, demands around pay that, that, um, that have a keep up with inflation. Um, yeah, and regularity, like I said, the, the scheduling can be so unpredictable, um, especially in parts of the United States that it's just, it's so common to lose hours and then you don't, um, you don't have any sense of how much money you're going to take home. So demands around, um. Uh, predictability, being able to um, to budget and to yeah. It's 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 really interesting that there's just so much commonality, like at the other side of the Atlantic, in terms of what we're fighting for right now. With like democracy is a huge thing, actually, on the job, zero work contracts and stuff like that. I would like add one thing actually that our branch is campaigning on at the minute, which is is it's like it it reflects like quite a similar. Um, thing is the health and safety is that we one issue that comes up time and time again in our branch meetings is actually the huge prominence of sexual harassment in the industry um, we did a survey actually uh, of like as many hospitality workers as we could and we found that n only nine percent of hospitality workers uh, felt that when they raised a complaint of sexual harassment that anything was actually done about it you know and that's such a huge issue so we've got together with actually with um uh, rosa the socialist feminist campaigning group to actually build a charter on how to concretely tackle uh this issue and i think as, as i was saying similar to health and safety it just raises the question again that like it's actually workers it's actually us in these jobs who do these jobs every single day who know exactly what needs to be done and the issue is there's no will there from the employers through like employers in in, uh, in 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 Northern Ireland at the start of the COVID pandemic were even arguing in a completely anti-science way that social distancing should just be abolished so they could squeeze more people into venues you know so you have like that on one hand where the employers are just so obviously only care about their own bank accounts versus ordinary people here to actually taking the initiative to really concretely deal with these issues. I love that you mentioned Rosa, Amy. We've talked about it a few times on our show, um, but it's a really amazing organization, um, you know, in many countries around the world. And it's so important that we're linking, um, you know, gender um, issues to labor. You know, I, I remember, like, I, I was just going to say the same thing. I remember when I was a barista, which was like 10 years ago, we had the same issues, but because there wasn't this kind of organization um, you know, drive, it, it just felt hopeless and helpless. And it's so amazing to see what kind of organizations like Rosa, like unions, like this, the, and the power that they're getting by the fact that at workers of every sector and especially hospitality uh, are organizing. It's just amazing to see that, like, p pointing out this connection. And I think also beyond just the, you know, harassment you might experience in the workplace itself, but also like at abuse at home and all of these things that unions are fighting really hard to have, you know, uh, some kind of, um, I guess, not understanding because we don't expect bosses to understand, but like actual tangible uh, ways for people to, uh, you know, handle these kinds of abuse. So it's so amazing to see the actual, I guess, tangible impact that um, uh, the unions and organizations like Rosa can have on these things. Yeah, the question of gender equality is is 
so inherently linked to the labor movement. I mean, you know, I'm a unionized worker and even in my union, I'm fighting against the, you know, the leadership to expand our reproductive health care, which Amy, I definitely want to get into a discussion about the labor leadership. But before we do that, Sam, um, one of the demands that I know your uh, union and coffee shop is fighting for is, uh, you know, specifically around the question of health care for all. And I think that's really inspiring and like ahead of where a lot of the labor movement is. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in this this context of um, this this young wave of workers who have been at the forefront of so many social movements, um, so many fights for gender equality, for trans equality, for um, for racial justice, for so much of that. Um, you know, there's this consciousness that like we're we're drowning in debt. There's there's student debt there, but there's also like medical debt, and the, um, you know, there's so many of us that don't have health insurance. Period. Um, and there's this culture of like absolute desperation and, um, uh, you know, um, in, in Starbucks, interestingly, there's like an insidious side of this, which is where, um, Starbucks actually does have a certain amount of coverage that, um, that young people know about that it will cover, um, certain costs associated with gender affirming healthcare. Um, that's really hard to come by when you're a young person in low wage work in the United States. Um, and, and so you see people taking these jobs and staying with the company for nine, 10 years so that they, um, they have that um, access to the necessary like healthcare, surgeries, treatments that they need. Um, but like the, the flip side of that is um, it's, it's really, really exploitative work. You're, um, you're, you're stuck there. You can't leave the job because then you lose your access to your healthcare. Um, and at the same time, it's still limited to such a very small pool of, of people who are working over a certain number of hours threshold um, at Starbucks, you know, and, and smaller businesses, local shops like my own. Um, if there is health care, it's limited to a very small number of, of the, um, the most like full time or higher up workers. Um, it generally does not include gender affirming health care, um, generally has very high um, deductibles and other costs like that. And it comes down to the, the point of all of this, that um, there's, there have been these waves of, of social movements and, and protest activity. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the, 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 the question is like, can we afford healthcare? Can we afford um, safety? Can we afford these very material things? Um, and, at the, you know, in the absence of Medicare for all, you know, trans inclusive Medicare for all that, that, that covers gender affirming care, that covers free, safe and legal abortion, um, all these different things. We don't have that, but we do have um, our power as unions to um, to extract that concession from the bosses by organizing. So where we see this demand of, of trans inclusive health care coming up um, in these unions, um, that's the context that is happening in. Yeah, I think to me, I guess, as someone who lives in Britain, um, it sounds ins like insane that you would even need to talk about healthcare. And it's so important that this kind of, uh, the unions are taking this on board and like pushing for it, even like, you know, outside of the context of COVID, but especially in the context of the, context of the pandemic. But I wanted to ask uh, uh, Amy a little bit about kind of, the, because uh, of kind of your role in the union, I was wondering because a lot of the times we're seeing this discrepancy between kind of workers really ready for action and like, you know, organizing en masse and then union leaders maybe pushing the consciousness back a little bit. And I, I was wondering what what is kind of like your position on it? What, what do you think um, needs to happen for the unions to actually, you know, do what they need to do and help workers? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. We could probably talk for a long time on that alone. But um, yeah, I think, well, I mean, if we look at, I mean, we've talked already about like the lack of trade union identity in these sectors, you know, and when you look at where that's came from, um, you've really seen like over the past couple of decades, the approach of the trade unions, the official trade union movement hasn't been to actually go out and reach out to young workers to organize new sectors. Instead, you just see, you know, them sort of doing backroom deals with employers, um, which benefits themselves as well. You know, that's their priority, which has meant it's left, you know, like a, a whole generation of young people to not really get the point of a trade union, not really actually see it as a vehicle for struggle because they hadn't been vehicles for struggles. They were too busy trying to get their sweetheart deals, let's be real. And I think like the fact that 
that that was you know the approach that sort of social partnership approach dominated for so long it's meant that like um quite quite a lot of of you know people right at the top of the trade unions uh really really wealthy um uh, uh like officials and stuff like that are actually quite scared of embracing this new radical uh, layer of young people as as sam mentioned that have that have really helped spearhead camp a number of campaigns over the past years because they're worried about that what that could do actually to their cushy positions and relationships with you know these these big employers um so then you do see a conflict with when when these new young people come into the trade unions you do see a conflict between them and the bureaucracy because their priorities are so different um in terms of wanting to go out wanting to fight on these issues and then there being that like yeah that conservatism don't want to rock the boat um and i think there's definitely a disconnect uh, between you know these 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 sections of the trade unions that we need to try um overcome and it's actually something that uh, uh hospitality reps have been talking about at the minute in terms of like how can we actually bridge this gap? Like, what are the actual problems? And like I mentioned, a lot of these, you know, a lot of the, a lot of people who have worked for trade unions for a long time can be on wages that are unimaginable to so many ordinary workers, you know, tens and tens of thousands of pounds. I think if it was the case that those uh, officers, for instance, were on the same wages or the, the same average wage of the people that they're there to represent, you would see that they are that them have an actually more vested interest in changing those things. There's also a question of democracy as well. And like when these young workers are actually getting involved in the union, organizing their workplaces, where do you go from there? Do you know how can we help them? How, how can we help them have a voice and actually drive their unions and have those radical young people actually being the drivers of the unions and not just being told what to do and where to go, you know. If I can um, add to that a little bit, actually, um, you know, I, I think just going off of that, we've seen these um, these spontaneous actions that show what um, a lot of these newly organizing workers are prepared to do. The, um, the strike in Buffalo that we talked about earlier, um, you know, to, to some extent, that was a, a, a reflection of the types of spontaneous actions that you um, you always saw before the unions were present. You know, I, I in my understanding, I, I could be slightly off on this, but um, that was not necessarily something that uh, there was any build up for. It was just um, the understaffing got to a point where the workers who were on shift that day were prepared to uh, to make this really bold decision and to, to organize that. Um, that's an extension of the types of um, actions that you've seen, you know, during the Great Resignation, you see these these hilarious like pictures of signs that workers have, have taped up to the door saying, "Sorry, we're closed. We all quit because management wasn't paying enough and paying us enough." Um, all of that energy is there, and courageous union leadership would tap into that, would help steer it, would help direct it, would help um, help those workers who are like ready to take really bold action understand where our power is. Um, you know, by, by getting organized, by having um, having bold demands, like consolidating all of that frustration um, into really contract, um, concrete demands and helping us come come up with a strategy for winning them. So so all of that, um, that democratic impulse is just a need to um, to, to organize it and to uh, to give some direction to it. Um, that's something that we should all be bringing into our unions. Well, and Sam, you mentioned this courageous leadership. I think that's really important. Amy, you know, talked about how, um, you know, our labor leaders, m the overwhelming majority of the time, get paid much more than the uh, workers that they, they represent, sometimes in the six figures when they're the workers they represent are making minimum wage. Um, but, you know, we're seeing elected officials they're not, you know, uh, labor leaders, but uh, uh, city councilors like Shama Sawant, for example, um, and also a, a DSA city councilor in Chicago and another one in Minneapolis um, take that, you know, uh, courageous leadership that you're talking about and, and actually uh, do something about it in regards to the Starbucks workers. Sam, can you talk a little bit about... Um, what these three city councillors are putting forward in their cities in regards to the Starbucks workers? Yeah, absolutely. So this was something that um, that Shama Sawant, city councillor out in Seattle, um, member of Socialist Alternative, um, she put forward this this resolution when we had this uh, this rally and this press conference um, uh, a, a week and a bit ago, um, uh, calling on the rest of city council to to come out publicly and stand on the side of workers and against Starbucks is union busting. And I, you know, the question of union busting, this is something that we should um, also make, like 
definitely get into, but that's a, a really entrenched uh, thing. Like that's that's no joke to be talking about. So it is absolutely necessary. We see these like, um, you know, sort of symbolic gestures on the part of some elected officials saying we support unions. You see politicians like taking um, selfies with with some of these organizing workers, but to uh, to put on paper as an as a body of elected officials and say, yeah, we stand unequivocally on the side of workers against corporate union busting. Um, that's a bolder step because then it, it helps expose um, the types of tactics that these companies will turn to to uh, to try and crush the unions. That could be upfront, which it has, you know, absolutely been in the case of Starbucks. Um, you see. Um, you know, Starbucks has over 9,000 stores, corporate-owned stores, just in the United States, um, countless more around the world. Um, it is nothing to Starbucks to close a store if there's a whisper of union activity there. Um, they uh, famously in Buffalo sent in um, 90 or 100 um, executives from from Seattle and from all over the country. You had the, the like, vice president of of North of North America retail in there cleaning the bathrooms and taking um, young workers like out to these fancy dinners to like have these persuasive conversations like yeah we're listening we are we are on we are with you we will fix everything um, just trust us you don't need a union to do that um, all of that um, th- these resolutions that uh, that Shama Sawant that Byron Citro Lopez in Chicago um, that the um, the representatives in in Minneapolis as well. Um, uh, you know, this is this is a con like condemning that uh, that disgusting behavior on the part of Starbucks and um, and helping draw attention to it and um, and put um, these you know these these elected socialists or democratic socialists um, helping them uh, you know show that they are actually prepared to stand in solidarity with workers and um, and lead from the front. Yeah, I think it's absolutely disgusting to see kind of the reaction from uh, the, like corpor- these corporations to unionizing, which is like a completely, you know, even in the like kind of so-called capitalist kind of uh, explanation to the world, it's like a basic right, right? And at the same time, we're seeing how they're shaking in their boots when this is happening. Um and I think that there's a reason why they are shaking in their boots at the same time, because these unions have so much potential and we talked about this so much. And I, I wanted to actually ask you, Amy, because I read you wrote this really brilliant uh, kind of solidarity letter to the uh, 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 to the uh, Starbucks workers um, from kind of like your perspective as a barista, barista in Northern Ireland. And obviously, I think that this has a huge impact internationally. But I was wondering if you can kind of explain why you felt the need to write that letter and kind of the, the beyond the impact they had personally, what impact it can have globally if we all do that in solidarity. Yeah, um, I mean, it's just like like I mentioned at the at the start, like just what the Starbucks workers organizing at the minute, especially in a sector like ours, is just so significant. It really represents a turning point. You know, it shows people actually that you don't have to put up with the conditions you're dealing with. There's like, there, there, there is an option there where you actually can get together with your co-workers. You can exercise your power to actually say, no, we're not putting up with this anymore. Um, and I think like, uh, I mean, it's just, I, for instance, in my workplace, like obviously I'm a, I'm a trade unionist. I can talk about this stuff all day, but like the fact that you know my coworkers were coming to me and being like, "Have you seen these baristas over there? Like they could be getting paid loads of money soon. We should do something like that." And it's like, yeah, exactly. This is what I've been thinking this whole time. And like, um, just like, but even just like the impact that has on people's confidence. You know, I mentioned like I, I mentioned at the start about cafe closures. Like that's you know that happens in my workplace where. They were like, listen, these Starbucks workers, um, you know, they, they they were scared of like the situation with COVID. So they just went on strike and they were like, listen, half of our staff we're off with, we're off with COVID and we're all tired. So do you reckon we should just lock up two hours early and just take it, like take a nap for a while? So we just closed the shop early for two hours. So I think like, yeah, I just really can't get over like 
just really can't express enough just how much of like an excitement this has to an industry that hasn't been touched by trade unions to an industry where people hadn't even learned of trade unions they had thought of it as something like so far into them just to see that actually it's just standard it's just ordinary workers coming together and just being like you know what we actually demand better and here's what we're going to do about it you know Amy that's so inspiring and I love that you guys are just like you know what fuck it we're just gonna lock up like we're tired we're done like we're done serving coffee for the day and that's the type of that's the type of action though we really do need we really do need that sort of democracy in the workplace we really do need to come together around demands and just that international solidarity um, is so so important. So I want to thank you both for coming on the show with us today. It was great having you um, and good luck out there. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again real soon. And to everyone who's working and isn't unionized, go and get unionized. <laughs> Do it as soon as you can, because look at what can happen when you unionize. That's right. This was such a great episode. Always exciting to hear about unionization. And I, I know that like I keep hearing all around me, even though I'm not a barista anymore, keep hearing all around me about people uh, unionizing. And it's just so amazing to see these kind of drives that we've seen, I think, across the world uh, in the last few uh, months. So uh, really important to discuss it in the context of Starbucks, but generally, I think. So uh, really happy to uh, kind of hear from Amy and Sam. But now we're going to move on to our favorite part of every week, which is the shout out of the week. And this week we are going to uh, talk about the Clover, uh, the Clover um, uh, strikers in South Africa. Uh, we had a international uh, day of action on the 27th of January where people from all around the world uh, went to the, the nearest South African embassy uh, to their home to protest and uh, uh, kind of show solidarity with the 5,000 clover workers uh, that have been on strike since the, the 22nd of November uh, last year. And obviously our organization fully supports the workers and their demands and uh, also calling for the escalation of demonstrations to kick off this year of struggle. Um, and as we've seen, there's so much uh, struggle going on. Uh, so it's really important to support uh, workers that are on strike like that. And I think that it's also important to mention that kind of, you know, we all know that in order for companies to maintain kind of the, the competitiveness under this uh, capitalist system, they have to always increase their profits uh, and expand, expand their market share. And for the working class, what this means is not, you know, more benefits and uh, better stuff, but uh, it means uh, uh, lowering wages, job, job cuts. Uh, and kind of increase prices and consumer goods as well. And that's basically a race to the bottom uh, uh, and worsening inequality. And this is why I think the demand that the clover, uh, the clover strikers uh, have to nationalize clover becomes such an important part uh, and, and kind of stepping stone to workers' control over the entire economy. Uh, because kind of in order to abolish this sick capitalist system, that puts profits before people, we have to kind of uh, think about the systemic ways that we can change this. And we can't do this without replacing the system with a socialist economy that's based on need and on the democratic decisions of the workers, who, like we said over and over again in this episode, know best uh, what is happening in their industry. So solidarity to uh, the clover workers and uh, thank you for everyone who participated in uh, pickets and demonstrations outside the South African embassies in that country. Uh, now, this is the end of our episode, uh, so hopefully see you again soon next week. Uh, you know where to find us, uh, and see you around. This is World to Win. Every Sunday, we broadcast with speakers from across the globe, bringing you the latest news and analysis on the fast-moving global events from a socialist perspective. Subscribe to the International Socialist Alternatives YouTube page and click the bell to get notified when we go live for a new episode. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram because there's a lot to do and we have a world to win. When they fight! When they fight! When they fight! Solidarity!